Okay, we're starting on the next session here. The next session is going to be our keynote presenter. Uh, I'm pleased to have uh, Dr. Hal Putoff. Uh, he's actually Dr. Harold Putoff, but uh, he goes by the name of Hal and uh, it's a very affectionate name and I'm just thrilled that we can have somebody of uh, Hal's caliber <laughs> with us. Uh, many of us have known Hal for quite some time. Uh, We've heard a lot about him. I mean, he's had a quite an exciting career uh, with this whole thing. I wish I were actually him. <laughs> I mean, he's 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 had some incredible uh, incredible experiences. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, I'm just glad to have him. Uh, Hal is the president and CEO of Earth Tech International, and the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin, uh, the IASA. Uh, he's earned his PhD from Stanford University in 1967. Hal's professional background spans more than five decades of research at General Electric, Sperry, and the National Security Agency, Stanford University, SRI International, and since 1985 as president of ETI and director at IASA. He has published numerous papers on quantum physics, lasers, and space propulsion, and has patents issued in the laser energy and communications fields. Hal regularly serves various foundations, corporations, and government entities, including, uh, of course, the Department of Defense and Intelligence Community, as an advisor on leading edge technologies and future technology trends. Was a senior science advisor and contractor to the DOD's OSAP and ATIP program and was a founder of the To The Stars Academy, TTSA. I'm pleased to have uh, and introduce Dr. Hal Putoff. And Hal, I'm turning it over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Rich. I appreciate uh, the, the introduction and also the opportunity to uh, share my thoughts with uh, members of the SCU, it's one of my favorite groups for sure. So I'm gonna hit the share screen here and um, hopefully that will take me where I wanna go. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, you should see my my starting slide is that uh, uh, showing up says UAP studies managing the transition intelligence problem to scientific problem. Okay. Let's start with the intelligence problem. As uh, all of us or many of us who, who are attending this conference know uh, for many years, actually several decades, the Air Force had a program to take in reports from the public and also from military people and uh, try to analyze them and come up with some kind of conclusion. And that was Project Sign, Project Grudge, Project Blue Book, and so on. <clears throat> but uh, eventually, the Air Force kind of wanted to get out of it, <laughs> frankly. So they gave a contract to the Condon Committee at the University of Colorado. And they did a year study. And then they finally uh, said, uh, uh, science isn't going to be served by chasing this uh, subject area. So we recommend that it be terminated. And so in fact, uh, in early 1970, it was terminated. And now what that meant was that after that time, if you were to call the public affairs office at the in the Air Force and say, well, what's the latest with regard to UFO sightings? It would turn out that uh, they'd simply say, oh, no, 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 we, we, we got out of that business in uh, early 90, 1970, uh, nothing to see here. Uh, we're, we're, we're not, uh, we're not uh, investigating UFOs anymore. However, that actually wasn't true. It turned out that the very memo by General Bollander that terminated the project, terminated Blue Book project, down in the fine print had a statement, reports of UFOs which could affect national security would continue to be handled 
to the standard Air Force procedures designed for this purpose. So in fact, the truth of the matter is the work did not stop in 1970. It continued uh, in the shadows, primarily in black programs, not revealed to the public. And it went on that way for some decades until finally, in December of 2017, the New York Times was able to come forth with a uh, front page story revealing one of the programs that had been carried out uh, in the recent years called Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. This was a, a major story. It sort of started the whole current uh, media coverage that, that, that we've been seeing. And of course, as soon as that story came out, mainstream press coverage uh, was all over it. And what was different this time <clears throat> was really the quality of sources going public. In previous times, if you had someone just simply saying they saw a light in the sky or whatever, uh, you know, the tinfoil hat crowd label could have been thrown at it. The subject was very stigmatized. But here, the quality of sources going public once this New York Times article came out, uh, consisted of people like ex-Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, who in fact was the one who set up the most recent program. Top-rated F-18 pilots like Dave Fravor and so on, who encountered uh, UAP at close range, and a number of significant DOD and intelligence community officials. So suddenly we had some coverage without the usual stigma. Well, what about this program, ATIP? <clears throat> Actually, it was initiated in 2008 under the acronym OSAP, Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program. But uh, very quickly, uh, it, by anyone in the program, we use the nickname ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. So <clears throat> that, that's, that's the phrase I'll use to describe it. Well, the program was initiated by DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and they were concerned about threat from UAP. As they said, crafts, drones of unknown origin. Now, what was different now as compared to earlier years is there are multiple surveillance and reconnaissance platforms of high quality. And so true intelligence assessments could be carried out uh, with really good data because we had excellent reconnaissance data coming in. And the conclusion was that there appeared to be intelligently controlled mechanical devices uh, capable of performing feats beyond current technological capabilities. For example, exceed the sound barrier without a sonic boom. So this, this is what caused the program to be set up. Now from the DIA standpoint, <clears throat> of course it's Department of Defense, so their job is to defend the country against potential threats. Obviously, they would have to be concerned about what could be called the current threat. And that is this phenomenon is going on, possibly a foreign, foreign der derivation, say the Chinese or Russian, could include off world, no way to tell until it's absolutely nailed down. And being globally deployed and tested, including in the continental United States. Now that's kind of the obvious threat. And you might think that that was really the threat of concern. As it turns out, that was not the most major current threat. The major current threat was really future threat. What if potential adversaries, say the Chinese, Russians, whoever, achieve significant breakthroughs in development of disruptive technologies based on their own evaluations of UAP phenomena? from sensor data or crash retrieved materials. That was the real concern for the DIA. That's what's in their remit to be paying attention to. And while they should be concerned about that, uh, in, in, the, in the warmed up period in interacting with the Soviets, uh, we were able to obtain uh, a major document about the thickness of a telephone book showing that 
for example, as early as 1991, they had a very major UFO investigation program going forward under the military unit 73790. It was a large scale effort. I show this graph. I recognize that uh, you probably won't be able to read the fine details in these in these blocks, but basically I show it to, to emphasize the fact that they had a number of military organizations, a number of uh, science labs, a number of materials labs, all cooperating together and collaborating uh, to try to get to the bottom of understanding what the UAP phenomena actually was. So this is a serious effort for them. And of course, they're worried about the same thing we're worried about. And that is, suppose we make some great progress on the basis of uh, materials or crash retrievals or just our analysis of the data, uh, they'd be worried that we could get the jump on them. So this went back and forth by both sides, typically under black programs. And of course, now uh, with all the news coverage that's come out in the last uh, couple of years, I'm sure many of us have seen uh, interviews of uh, Commander Dave Fravor, who talks about his interaction with the Tic Tac. And again, uh, for those who say, well, can you really determine something from kind of a fuzzy video or whatever, it's important and he's emphasized that <clears throat> when these events occurred, there were multiple sensor platforms recording this. Radar recorded its presence, IR recorded its presence, Dave Fravor had eyeballs on it, even uh, did a little semi-dogfight uh, chasing it. And um, so anyway, that, that's been now presented to the public. And of course, uh, many of us are familiar with Lou Elizondo, who's had a lot of uh, media coverage. He was uh, one of the last directors of the ATIP program. And he felt that not enough was being uh, treated seriously. And so for that reason, he left the Pentagon in order to be more public about doing whatever he could to legitimize the topic. Many of you are familiar with Lou. Um, he was a keynote speaker at the first SCU conference a couple of years ago, uh, recently appeared on 60 Minutes, so and on Tucker Carlson uh, a number of times. So uh, <clears throat> he's out there doing what he can to get the word out. Lou is the person that, uh, toward the end of the program, that I reported to. So I know him very well. Now, one of the outcomes of official legitimization and all this media coverage was, <clears throat> for the first time, the Navy confirmed that the videos, for example, really are unidentified aerial phenomena. That's really a significant statement. For example, if it were, let's say, secret Navy platforms, drones, whatever, that they didn't want to reveal, okay, then they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't reveal it. But they wouldn't come out with a statement and a bold-faced lie to say they're truly unidentified. So this statement that they're unidentified is, is, is to be taken seriously. Now, as a result of all this public exposure, the Navy drafted new guidelines for their pilots to report the UFOs. As we now know, if you've been following uh, the news, pilots have been seeing UFOs all the time over the last decades. But by and large, they didn't report them because they were concerned that they would lose their flight status, be thought that maybe they were you know, drinking or on drugs or something. But now that uh, this has all come forward, it's now a requirement that they report uh, what they see. And so that's why even now a number of uh, their reports are actually getting uh, uh, leaked out to the media. OK, well, let's get back to what the DIA program was about. And <clears throat> this is the transition from the intelligence problem, which it obviously is, to a scientific problem. 
the broad area announcement asks that this list of engineering aspects be addressed in this program. The contract monitor from DIA, brilliant physicist, very smart guy. I have to say he's one of us, basically. Uh, he recognized that what really would count uh, to make any kind of progress in this area, in addition to just simply collecting data on observations, would be to try to actually figure out anything we could about the technology involved. And so that's what the program was primarily directed toward. Now, DIA chose Bigelow Aerospace as a contractor to address the potential UAP threat. Bigelow Aerospace established BASS, Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, uh, and hired uh, you know, some 50 investigators and so on. I mean, this is, this is a big operation. And Bigelow contacted me at EarthTech International and asked that I collaborate as a subcontractor which I, of course, uh, agreed to do. And so that's how I became a subcontractor and a senior advisor to the ATIP program. So now, because we have been, and we have the remit to look at engineering aspects, we now had the opportunity to manage the transition from the intelligent problem, which we're gonna let other people worry about, to the scientific problem, which is of interest to us. So let's start with a hypothesis, which is exactly what I did. Let's assume materials are potentially available from UAP. For example, a crash retrieval. Or if we don't have materials now, we might have materials in the near future. So let's assume that this is the case. If so, as you can well imagine, it would be subject to high level security and compartmentalization. Not so much that it's to be kept from the American public, but rather anything that might be learned in a program like this <clears throat> could be kept from potential adversaries who will be looking for clues uh, to develop their technologies. Well, how are you gonna handle that? You got high level security compartmentalization It'd be difficult for contractors that might be working in this area to obtain expert opinion and critical technologies. You just don't call up your local university PhD and say, you know, I've got a problem here. I've got this chunk of UFO material. I can't quite understand it. Would you take a look? I mean, it would all be out. I mean, that, that's the end of black program coverage of it. So how do you address this issue? High level security, compartmentalization, Difficult for contractors to obtain expert opinion on critical technologies. This was the challenge that I was given. Okay, my response to the challenge was pretty straightforward. I said, okay, uh, well, let's commission white papers about all the from subject matter experts around the world, unclassified, and simply ask them where their particular aerospace related subject area would be in the year 2050. I represented it as a general survey of aerospace futures. Of course, I didn't say, uh, you know, this is really to help us out with the UFO program. <laughs> no, I just simply said, this is a general survey. But these are unclassified white papers. So I could go anywhere in the globe, and I did. I mean, some of our best uh, papers on invisibility, for example, came out of Scotland. And I told the people, that I contact, contracted to develop these papers, <clears throat> that they were free to publish their results in, in physics journals. That, that'd be just fine. So I let out 38 contracts over a two year period. I'm gonna show you the topic areas that I covered. These are the areas that I considered significant and that I thought we should get our best evaluation of. And you can see even talking about things like warp drive, um, space-time metric engineering, traversable wormholes. I mean, we weren't just digging around the edges. We were basically going for the juggler to the degree that uh, I thought we could 
we could do it. Here's another set of papers. The high energy laser weapon one was uh, classified, but the rest, the rest were unclassified. Pushing the envelope, negative mass propulsion, uh, whatever. Um, <clears throat> Anti-gravity for aerospace applications. As you can see, we really wanted to cover the very edgy topics. But since we're going to experts and asking them where their subject would be in 2050, uh, we were giving them permission to extrapolate, to think out of the box. And that's what gave us really good data. Another set of papers. This is uh, some, some, some sums up the 38. Even field effects on human biological tissues, um, where there have been uh, interactions that uh, might have led to injury or something. So anyway, there we were. What do I do with these papers? <clears throat> well, I wrap them all up, bundle them all up, and send them back to DIA. And they're put on a Pentagon server called JWIX, Defense Intelligence Reference Documents, DIRDs, as we call them. These were then accessible by contractors, by the intelligence community, by DOD personnel, but they were not released to the public. Uh, that was not the case here. And I'm told that this set of 38 papers basically became the bestseller in the Pentagon uh, JWIC system for some time. So it was a very high quality set of papers and people from all different kinds of areas access them and were interested in them, even if they weren't particularly interested in the UAP phenomena. Now, <clears throat> recall I said that these were not being released to the public. However, as I mentioned, I told the individual authors that they were free to publish their results. And so if it turns out that you have interest in any of the subjects that uh, I've listed here, if you go to the documents section of the SCU website, you'll find the list of the papers along with the authors and their uh, academic positions or whatever. And so feel free, I encourage you to uh, contact them in any areas that are of interest to you and see if uh, they'll share uh, what they developed in developing these papers. Now, to give you an idea of, you know, what kinds of topics uh, were covered and how thoroughly were they covered, I'm going to give an example in space-time metric engineering. I use this example because actually this is the paper that I wrote for this series of 38 papers. And the challenge that uh, I gave to myself was, can reported anomalous observations of UAP be accounted for on the basis of known physics. And you know, apparent reduced inertial mass, right angle turns and high velocity and so on. And generally, if you're listening to the news, um, TV interviews and so on, it's always emphasized that this all seems to be so well beyond any kind of physics we can imagine. But actually, because of the approach I took, my answer was to the question, can report anomalous observations be accounted for in base of known physics? My answer was yes. And I'll show you why I say that. What I used was an engineering approach to general relativity, uh, which is kind of an unusual uh, flag to carry. Of course, we know Maxwell's equations give us electromagnetism. And then by engineering the equations of electromagnetism, we uh, develop Wi-Fi, radar, TV, whatever. Well, Einstein's equations are sort of like Maxwell's equations. <clears throat> Up till now, they've been used primarily by astrophysicists who are working out uh, the consequences of the merger of neutron stars or whatever. But anyway, uh, there's a space-time metric that comes out of Einstein's equations. And so the question I posed to myself was, well, can we engineer the space-time metric for interstellar flight? at least in principle, even if we don't have the energy or 
technical tools to do it, at least what do the equations say is possible? And so in examining uh, Einstein's equations, I was able to find out that in a certain select uh, set of conditions, effects that seem to correlate with UAP observations could come out of solutions of Einstein's space-time metric equations. Here I've got it in terms of a particular parameter, kappa. But uh, <clears throat> under the right engineering conditions, you could reduce your mass, you go faster than the speed of light, um, get repulsive anti-gravity forces, uh, just what you would like to see. The way I arrived at this was that I, I, I took a sheet of paper and on the left-hand side, I wrote down what are all the claims that come out of observations of UAP. And then I wrote down on the right-hand side of the paper, what are all the th effects you might expect to see if you engineered the space-time metric? And they fit together, hand in glove. I'm going to throw in one high-tech slide here for the general relativity buffs in the crowd, where I specifically list the space-time metric uh, components. If you're interested, uh, as I said, we were permitted to publish our papers. So I published this paper in a journal, peer reviewed, and uh, it's uh, posted uh, on the SCU website uh, in the document section. So if you're into this kind of thing, feel free to take a look. And what kind of predictions do we get out of it? Well, what about the velocity of light constraint? You can't go fast on velocity of light. Well, that's a statement out of special relativity, not general relativity. And we hear about wormholes and so on. Well, to an engineer, the speed of light is given by that equation there. C is one over the square root of mu zero epsilon zero, the permeability and permittivity of the vacuum. So in space-time metric engineering, you go in and you simply re-engineer mu and epsilon to be much smaller, which means that in that region of space, C is much higher. And therefore, it's zipping across the universe in a wormhole is not in principle ruled out. And I'm talking science fiction here. <clears throat> I mean, this is academic textbook stuff that general relativity uh, people investigate all the time. So that could handle the issue of, well, they're so far away, how could they ever get here? Another consequence of engineering uh, space-time metric under conditions that would lead to the kind of effects that, that we, we think we're observing is that there tends to be a blue shift. What do I mean by that? I mean, in the rooms where you're sitting right now, you don't see most of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's in the infrared, it's in the heat spectrum. What we see with our eyes uh, in the visible is a relatively small part of the EM spectrum. But under the conditions in which space-time metric has been engineered to produce the kind of effects you might expect to see in a UAP, you get blue shift, which means, first of all, some of that infrared is going to be upshifted into the visible part of the spectrum. And so you'd expect craft to be actually quite bright, which is one of the things that, in fact, is reported. Well, a way we could check that out, uh, set up some spectrum analyzers and see if you record a black body spectrum that's been blue shifted. So that's a challenge I give to the spectrum analytical crowd. And of course, uh, with this blue shift, there's a prediction of near field exposure injuries. For example, the visible can be blue shifted up into the UV and you get sunburn injuries, often reported by people who claim to have encountered a powered up craft at relatively close range. <laughs> or if you're too close, uh, it can even, uh, some of that visible spectrum, which ordinarily isn't harmful, can be shifted up into the soft X-ray region and you get radiation injury. Uh, Cash Landrum case, for example, uh, you know, could fit into this category. So there are specific predictions. In fact, during the ATIP program, we took a look at some data that came out of Claris Island investigation in Brazil 
1977-78. There's a tremendous amount of data collected by the Brazilian Air Force. Uh, thousand pages of documents, photographs, film, physiological effects. Uh, it was like scenes out of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So we collected up all that uh, information and examined it. And I'll just give you one, one graph here about it where we listed the medical injuries and uh, <clears throat> some of these same responses to claimed encounters at close range uh, do correlate with uh, what we've seen in, in, in some cases that we investigated. So that's, that's a prediction that comes out of space-time metric engineering. Now, by the way, it isn't that I thought of this all by myself. It turns out that there's an excellent book that uh, most people in UFO and UAP investigation seem to have overlooked. It's called Unconventional Flying Objects, written by Paul Hill, who's a chief scientist manager at NASA Langley Research Center. He came up with the idea that in order to match into the observations, the craft must have what he called a direct acceleration field. And uh, when you read his book, you realize it's, it's what today we would call metric engineering. It says gravitational like in nature, gravity canceling. It would permit 100 Gs relative to environment accelerations without any onboard high G forces. Uh, you could get supersonic flight through the atmosphere without sonic booms, which is one of our observations. And he did detailed calculations and computer simulations to show that with this metric engineering approach, you end up developing subsonic flow patterns of streamlines. So you prevent shockwave drag, you prevent aerodynamic heating, uh, just exactly what seems to match into the data. He predicted flight profiles that uh, matched observations. And so he came to the conclusion that UAP appear, at least some of them, appeared to be engineered platforms uh, on the order of 30 tons. I think he got that number from some dents in some railroad tracks, uh, demonstrating 100 G accelerations, 9,000 miles per hour in the atmosphere. Well, of course, as you can imagine, uh, while he was a chief manager at NASA, uh, no way he could, he could uh, publish this book. Back in those days, it definitely would have been a, a killer for his uh, profession. <clears throat> but he arranged that the book would be published posthumously. And so I highly recommend it. If you haven't uh, seen the book, please, please get it and, and read through it. It's, it's very detailed. Uh, a lot of graphing, a lot of uh, excellent work. Now, based on all of this, of course, I and my colleagues are not being quiet about it. Uh, <clears throat> we've listed uh, and provided a list here, provided a number of briefings to the Senate Armed Services Committee, the Senate Select Committee uh, Intelligence, uh, briefings carried out by myself, by Lou Elizondo, who, as I mentioned earlier, is a retired director of the DOD's ATIP program. Uh, Chris Mellon, uh, long career as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. So he has really good connections into uh, the Congressional Committee. And so he's been very active in briefing senators and congressmen. My colleague, Eric Davis, who is my Chief Science Officer at EarthTech International. Uh, and uh, so he's been involved in a number of these briefings. So a lot of briefings have taken place behind the scenes. Now, as we've heard from uh, what Rich said earlier, the Pentagon has set up a UAP task force. It was requested by Select's uh, Senate Committee for Intelligence, Senator Marco Rubio, who's the chairman of it. It was actually established and approved by the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Norquist. So this is finally getting treatment at the high levels where it deserves to be evaluated. It's led by the Navy under the cognizance of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. 
was created to improve, quote, understanding of and gain insight into the nature and origins of UAP. The mission is to detect, analyze, and catalog UAP that could potentially pose a threat to US national security. That's the Pentagon's requirement. And they were told to submit a report within 180 days to Congressional Armed Services Committee. It's supposed to be a broadly available unclassified report with a classified annex. And that's be, uh, if, they, if they keep to their uh, deadline, that should be coming out uh, before the end of June. So we'll see uh, what, what it says. And that's being taken seriously all over the globe. Uh, here's a major document that came out of the Israeli think tank, the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies, uh, where they outline whatever has been released so far about the Pentagon's UAP task force. And of course, recently, just in the last few days, we've seen additional press coverage in the New York Times about the upcoming release of this report. So it's definitely got everyone's attention. So what does that mean for the UAP topic? I think we can finally celebrate that the UAP topic has come of age. The former stigma is significantly reduced. The major factor, I think, is due to the increased sophistication of surveillance platforms. Uh, when it was just observations or a quick photo, you know, reason to be not so sure. But now with our unbelievably sophisticated surveillance platforms, getting data from multiple sources, all coordinated and collaborated, um, you just can't set these observations aside. So the data that even that's now publicly available lends itself to analysis and engineering evaluation, as I showed uh, with regard to the uh, 38 papers, uh, at least addressing topics that would be of significance for this area. Therefore, I think our scientific and engineering community can legitimately look forward to significant progress in our understanding of the UAP topic as the future unfolds and our uh, society for uh, that we have here, the SCU and MUFON and other areas beginning to make their contributions. I think we have a very rich future coming along in which this topic will be treated seriously. A lot of the stigma will be downplayed. Uh, and so it's going to be an engineering topic of, of great interest to all of us. And I saw even just today in the news that the Chinese also had their own UAP task force set up to try to understand what's going on. So this, this is a subject that's finally come of age and I think we're gonna hearing a lot about it and we all have an opportunity to contribute something of value. So that ends my comments and uh, be glad to uh, take any questions. Hey, uh, one one question for Hal. This is Joe Donato. Uh, can you can you talk a little bit about the Colaris event in Brazil? Obviously, at the unclassified level, but uh, is there any any perspective or additional context you could offer about that event that you could correlate with, say, other cases that may have taken place uh, in in Europe or Italy? relative to uh, directed energy capabilities or any kind of similarities between that event in Brazil and other events uh, in other places? I think the answer basically is yes. As you saw in my graph, uh, there's an enormous amount of data and it lasted over a couple of years. We actually met with the general from Brazil, who's in charge of seeing all this uh, get evaluated. And <clears throat> because there was uh, so much apparent direct 
interaction in many cases between the UAP phenomena and some of the uh, civilians there living on Calaris Island. That's why we got, in addition, all of the uh, medical data about uh, potential uh, damage to people. So in our case, we had uh, medical doctors who, you know, have access to studies carried out in various uh, U.S. agencies and um, scientific uh, groups like Los Alamos, whatever, uh, in which there have been collection of, of data typically done with you know, animal studies and so on, uh, <clears throat> which show what kinds of uh, injury you might expect uh, when getting too close to, let's say, what I would say is blue shifted uh, uh, infrared, I mean, up into the microwave and low x-ray region and so on. And the data from any studies where people have, for example, accidentally gotten exposed to high intensity microwaves or whatever, and then looking at the data out of uh, the Calaris incident, our medical investigators said that looks looks pretty pretty correlatable. And so, in fact, uh, I know some some of the people that were involved in those studies are also involved in looking at uh, additional data from you know, what we call the Havana syndrome and so on. So it does seem like it's all of a piece. Uh, I don't think we have the answers finally nailed down for sure, but there does seem to be at least relatable elements of all of those studies. The next question, I, I, folks, I'd like you to be able to use the question and answer in Whova. Uh, please direct your questions there. We're going through them and giving them out. Uh, as opposed to doing this. So we want you to uh, hit the people. There's a lot of people that have already put in questions. Hal, uh, here's one. Uh, wouldn't it be the right time to bring in a Russian and Chinese scientist as well? I'm convinced we can learn a lot from their history in the UAP, UFO, or the USO research. Well, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, obviously, uh, having people present their sightings from other countries and what kind of data they've collected um, would certainly be of use to us. But of course, if you have that colloquy, we're gonna to have to share some things that we've learned. And of course, that's, that's what's of great concern, at least in the DOD and intelligence community. And that is they may be missing a critical piece of data uh, to make some giant step forward and we just happen to have that particular critical piece of data. And if we shared it with them, uh, that would be a problem. So <clears throat> on the one hand, certainly at the unclassified level, uh, if we can find ways to collaborate with representatives of UFO investigative teams in China and Russia, I think, I think it would be a move in the right direction. But it, it would have to be handled uh, very carefully. Agreed. The DOD definition for threat includes elements of both intention and capability. Assuming the capability has been adequately demonstrated by recent videos, then what remains to is to determine the intention. But if we do not know what these craft are or who or what controls them, then how can we begin to assess intention? What would, it, what would be the criteria? Is it merely that they have yet to, to do harm? Well, one of the uh, sort of signatures, which I, I think you mentioned earlier, is the fact that a lot of the UAP observations have been near our nuclear facilities. And specifically, as has been reported, uh, wonderful book by Robert Hastings on UFOs and nukes, uh, <clears throat> some of our nuclear silos have been turned off. And we happen to know that the same thing has happened uh, in the so former Soviet Union. So when you look at that and you say, okay, what does that mean in terms of threat? Well, one way to interpret it is that they're good guys and they're just letting us know that if we get too frisky down here 
and decide to have a nuclear war, they can turn it off. On the other hand, if they're bad guys, you could say, okay, before they're just a reconnaissance group to check out whether they can be sure to take out our nuclear defense uh, when the armada shows up. <laughs> so of course, intention is everything. And um, at this point, as far as I know, we don't really have a clue. We read all the tea leaves to try to figure out what it is. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that, that's, it's, it's still up in the air. And that's why, uh, I mean, fortunately, at least we haven't had a lot of uh, shoot downs of American craft or other country craft uh, chasing UFOs. So that, that's uh, somewhat uh, encouraging. But it's really intention is sort of the big topic of interest that we really wish we could get to the heart of, and we're not there yet. So it's, it's uh, up in the air. But there's no doubt that the correlated sightings are definitely uh, seem to be tracking our uh, military elements. Uh, Hal, go ahead and stop sharing your screen if you can, just so we can see you. And I'm going to get the next uh, the next question here, just a moment. Okay, let's see. We get to see you come back here online. Sure. You should have a stop sh screen sharing. At the top of the screen. At the top of the screen, yeah. Oh, stop share. There you go. Stop okay. share. Now okay. we should be able to see you. Uh, Okay, so uh, the next the next question that we got here is: Do you have a do you have a working hypothesis as to how these craft navigate while encompassed in the field? Well, let's see what then we given electrogravitic field effects, removed the interior craft oh, by, the by. local space time. Uh, let's see. I heard some other voices behind, but yeah, I, I did too. Please, if everybody would go back on mute. I don't need to have you on here because it's it's going to switch around. All right. So again, I'll go back to seeing if I can restate the question. Do you have a working hypothesis as to how these craft navigate while encompassed in the field, given proposed electrogravitic effects or fields effectively remove the interior craft devices from the local space time? To first order, I'd say no, we have not figured that out. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, there are certain elements of, of what it's like if, uh, the, if the model is correct about you know, space-time metric engineering. Inside the craft, everything is working relatively normally. It's just that when they look out, they see the rest of the world in redshifted and moving in slow motion. So at least in terms of detecting their environment, uh, it's, it's pretty reasonable uh, you know, what, what they would be able to see. Now I know that in, in, in investigating things like uh, superluminal travel and wormhole travel, you get into the whole thing about, uh, well, can you get ahead of that in order to uh, direct yourself and so on? And that, that th those are questions that are still being investigated by people doing various general relativity models. But on the other hand, there's sort of kind of a simple side of it, and that is the people inside the craft, if there are people in the craft, uh, to them, things are very, very normal. Uh, <clears throat> so even though from the outside, we say, oh, you know, why aren't they fried by the blue shifted uh, radiation and so on? Well, it's that under this model, uh, all their atomic structure and chemical elements are also all blue shifted. So relatively speaking, to them, they're in a kind of a normal space. OK, uh, next question would be, with regard to intention, it would be important to know who they are and where they are from. What can you say about that? I can say I don't know the answer to that. All right. Uh, hi, the subject of this conference is compelling. I just compelling. want to know if there will be some mention to the supposedly big declassification of UFO related documents by several US organizations after the law signed by former President uh, Trump. 
and enacted in last December. I really have no clues about what would be disclosed, but general media and ufologists keep saying that the big thing is coming. What are your thoughts about the big thing? From my uh, contacts and so on, uh, I, I think although there will be enough information coming out to finally lay to rest that this is not a tinfoil hat subject and there's a reality to it and uh, <clears throat> the government is making a concerted effort to, to uh, learn more about it. Um, I think any truly deep state increased knowledge is likely not to come out. I don't see all the barriers falling. Understand. Uh, let's, let's either get on with it or allow the question to fade away as it deserves. The answer is either yes or no. Does the US government agency, example, NIST or Department of Energy, DOD, or any private US company organization or any similar entity anywhere else in the world have in its possession one or more vehicles in whole or in part built anywhere other than the earth? I cannot comment on that. For the entirety of your paper, oh, excuse me, wait, wait, let's go back to this. This just jumped on the screen. For the entirety of your paper, you're differentiating between altered space time due to a typical stellar mass versus space time engineered by an advanced craft. Yet in the time alteration section, are you suggesting that a craft could engineer both a time slowed condition, giving uh, an individual the experience of missing time, as well as the time sped up condition? Can you elaborate on missing time? Yes, in fact, I address that in uh, my paper, so you, you could check that out. Because <laughs> basically, if you're able to change the temporal aspect of your surrounding space, you can either speed it up or slow it down. And one of the off, one of the reports often uh, that they come forth, the people say, well, there I was, I, I was close to a craft, and suddenly all the sounds of nature, the birds, uh, the wind, you know, I didn't hear anything. Well, if time has been slowed down in that area and has gone into uh, infrasonics so that you wouldn't hear it, that's one of the uh, elements that you would expect to, to experience. And so then you also have obviously both kinds of things where you would interpret it as missing time because suddenly when you, if time got slowed down, so maybe you might be, let's say, in the craft's slowed down vicinity and for five minutes or whatever. But meanwhile, outside, uh, several hours have gone by. Then when you emerge, you'd say, oh my gosh, I've got missing time. It might not be that you actually missed any subjective time. It's just one of the consequences. And I, I discussed the details of that in my paper. All right, uh, next question is, is there a particular interpretation of the quantum measurement problem that fits best with the work you've done? Thoughts on Bohm? Well, I'm, 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 I'm an aficionado of uh, Bohm's uh, general approach. And, um, but uh, <clears throat> that, that all has to do with, uh, you know, quantum effects and so on. And uh, in pursuing the kind of models I pursued for the UAP, it's been general relativity, of course. And uh, so general relativity and quantum theory have, have not locked hands yet. So even though for other reasons and for other technologies that I'm involved in, I'm a big fan of Bohm and take into account uh, quantum effects, uh, I haven't uh, seen the connection to the UAP area. Hey, uh, Dr. Putoff, uh, one of the DIRD reports was published in the open literature by Professor Winterberg at UNR. Mm -hmm. In it, he goes into great length about possible ways to mine exotic matter caught in the moon's gravity well. Yes. Uh, what was your opinion on the paper and can you comment on its focus on the moon? 
Well, certainly uh, <clears throat> the general subject was uh, exotic matter, negative matter, and so on. Uh, and, and Winterberg is absolutely a top physicist. He's a student of Heisenberg in the old days. And uh, he's been part of uh, weapons development programs and so on. So, so he's somebody you, you do take seriously. But in this paper, he was certainly extrapolating, uh, you know, kind of way out there, because as far as I've, I know, even in talking with him, there hasn't yet been any evidence of that kind of matter being available. And then the particular application he thought of with regard to the moon struck me as being really on the edge. So uh, I don't really have any further commentary on it. Uh, here's a statement or a question. Uh, would NASA's recent statement and interest to now study this phenomena be redundant? If not, is there a specific area that you would recommend that they focus their efforts on? Well, in, in, the, in the public uh, unclassified uh, menu, uh, there are a number of claimed pieces from various crafts from crashes or, uh, you know, one was shot off uh, decades ago uh, that has pretty good credibility and so on. So I think setting up a materials lab would be the best. And then secondly, if there's any evidence of bases on the moon that they might have picked up, that would certainly be an area of interest. I don't know the answer to that, by the way, uh, only, you know, rumor and claim. So, uh, so anyway, I would say materials and any observations that show up in any um, tracking of various environments, those would be the two main things. Um, isn't it gonna be very difficult to make meaningful scientific progress in this area? So as long as, as it's controlled by the national security concerns? Well, as, as basically I was addressing in my paper, it, it, there is a problem because um, even if you've got some really good data that you feel you can't share, then national security concerns really holds back the scientific enterprise. Fortunately, though, I think uh, things are warming up, you might say. Uh, and, and now that the stigma has been reduced significantly, I think there are more cases uh, that will come forward and more examples of possibly materials will come forward. So I, I think that pro real progress can be made, even despite the fact that uh, there, there, there's a large national security uh, significance to some elements of the subject. Um, I guess the question, uh, this is an interesting one uh, that I've, you've often pondered and you probably might be aware of it, but anyway, uh, do you believe that the three Navy patents by Dr. Salvatore Cesar Pais, the so-called UFO patents, represent any true uh, technical breakthrough? I have no evidence that they do. I mean, some of the concepts involved uh, that, that he laid out uh, have a certain resonance with uh, some of the concepts that, that I consider. <clears throat> but to the degree that there are claims that uh, it's been observed in the laboratory, or technologies have been built to demonstrate those effects. Uh, I have no evidence for that. And I think that uh, the Navy has pretty well retracted. And I don't think it's just a cover up. I, I think uh, it was correctly retracted. Uh, there's a, it says reporter here. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, you touched on this today in a cursory way already. But from speaking with Dr. Wells, the author of the Pulsed High-Powered Microwave Technology paper expressed surprise to me about his work being included in this list of DIRDs. Uh, so I'm wondering specifically how researchers, scientists, and engineers were approached and contracted to produce these. I can tell you exactly uh, <clears throat> because I wrote the contract and basically, uh, and by the way, <laughs> In response to what Wells said, I have once, of course, we thought this would never particularly come out as being part of a UAP effort. And so once, uh, once Senator McCain, I think it was, 
arrange for those lists of papers and authors to be publicized. I just, I really cringed, wanted to hide below my desk thinking all these people are going to contact me and say, what? You didn't tell me that. Okay, what, what I did was I said, I, I'm, I'm basically representing Bigelow Aerospace, who's an aerospace company, uh, you know, moving forward into the future. And we'd like to do a survey on where your particular area might be, uh, you know, by the year 2050. And this is just to help uh, guide investment and uh, technology development uh, in the coming years. So the Bigelow Aerospace can be right uh, the tip of the spear in terms of beginning to explore uh, space and so on. So, so that, that's all they were told, that it was a survey for an aerospace corporation. Uh, thank you. Uh, isn't it time for science to reevaluate SETI and change focus on the future research in this area? Well, I certainly have that viewpoint. Um, and I'm glad to see that SETI, some SETI people have begun to consider uh, archaeological SETI. That is, are there any evidence of, uh, let's say, materials uh, possibly on the moon or on Mars and so on, not just looking for signals? Uh, <clears throat> I've, I've always been pretty skeptical that velocity of light transmission signals were likely to be very effective, uh, if for no other reason, almost certainly to be encrypted and everything else. So, so no, I, I think SETI really has to expand, at least, uh, you know, Professor Towns, Charles Towns, uh, laser inventor, uh, said, well, if you at least expand beyond EM and uh, include looking for laser signals. So that, that was optical SETI, that was a step in the right direction. But, but I think uh, also uh, the idea of looking for say molecules and uh, other genetic structures that may be somewhere in the earth uh, that might show some different kind of pattern that you might be able to claim was ET related. That, that kind of, so, so if SETI is broadened to include all possibilities and, and if they eliminate the idea that, well, they never came here, then I think uh, SETI could uh, make some real contributions. Um, per your paper presented, is the manipulation of the metrics associated with the theoretical Alcubierre drive essentially creating a finely tunable wormhole, depending uh, on intensity of warp field generated behind an object in the warped field? Well, that's one. That's In fact, that's one example I, I give in my paper. But uh, since his original publication of uh, the Alcubier warp drive, uh, there have been a number of papers by, I mean, well over a dozen of different kinds of both warp drives and wormholes. And uh, my colleague, uh, Eric Davis, has become a super expert on, on that kind of thing. He's right there at Huntsville at the Aerospace Corporation. You might, you might talk to him. So uh, that, that, that's an example. And it looks like it's not an example that is likely to be engineered. And there are some problems with it. But some of the additional papers that have taken off with that as the guiding principle uh, are well worth uh, taking a look at. Are tic tac type phenomena being seen in other countries right now? Uh, yes, they are. And um, and just recently, Lou Elizondo brought up another point, which was that back in the 50s, tic tac, exactly tic tac, that looks like a giant um, tic tac, uh, had been reported. And so he recently, uh, I guess, I guess this might, might have been on Tucker Carlson recently, last couple of nights, he showed this paper from the 50s, uh, with, uh, generated uh, by the military. It had been finally declassified, in which they saw precisely the tic tac shape. Hmm. Based on your extensive study of UAP, 
Is there any one theory of their origin that you think is more plausible? Well, it's, it, it's, a, it's a complex question and I, I've got a complex answer. <laughs> and, uh, uh, in fact, I wrote a paper which I haven't published called the ultra terrestrial hypothesis. And so I listed what are all the options? Okay, obviously it could be something by one of our uh, military groups here on the planet. Well, that's not standing in very strong legs these days. Uh, well, suppose there's uh, somebody arriving from a faraway solar system. Well, that's the standard ET hypothesis. But you know, maybe there's a group from the Middle Ages that happened to stumble on anti-gravity and they built a lab, uh, you know, in the Himalayas somewhere, and uh, it's a terrestrial group, and, and they just happened to, to discover that. Or maybe some ETs landed here uh, 50, 60,000 years ago, and they're just hiding out and not making themselves particularly known. And then suddenly, when we're dropping atomic bombs and polluting the environment, then uh, we're messing up their environment as well as our own, so they decide to come out of hiding a little bit. Uh, I mean, there's, there are all these possibilities. So I, I think, in fact, what I recommend in, in, in the paper that I wrote was that we should forget the science for a while and really get detectives to work following gumshoe kinds of aspects to determine of all the possibilities. And of course, we have Jacques Vallée who says, you know, maybe they're involving additional dimensions and so on. So, so I think all of those should be on the table until there's enough data to take them off the table. My personal viewpoint is I, well, I, I'm, I'm, I've got mixed opinions. I tend toward the ET hypothesis, but that's just barely above some of my other hypotheses. If, uh, if blue shifted light is coming out of the UAP, presume, presumptively there is a light source on the UAP that is being blue shifted. If we limit to night sightings, if we're limited to this, then the, the number of photons would not increase, but just blue shift. Uh, what would be producing the original light source before the blue shift? Well, for one thing, simply the heat spectrum of the craft. I mean, the craft is, let's say, in our atmosphere and probably has a temperature not that much different from, from the surrounding uh, atmosphere. And if that gets blue shifted, then you see pretty strong visible light due to the blue shifted infrared spectrum. So that would be, that would be one thing. And in terms of uh, you know sending out beams, uh, I mean, if they wanted to signal uh, someone on the Earth, they could send out what to them would be, um, let's say, an infrared beam, knowing it would be blue shifted. Um, actually, actually, uh, whatever light comes from a craft would, would be blue shifted. So you could arrange whatever you wanted if you have control over what kind of optical signals you're emitting. Is it conceivable that most or all of the UAP are Van Neumann probes, uh, possibly capable of self-replication and that they're innocently observing us? Uh, if so, then might the risk be an only an annoyance say we choose to formally acknowledge them, then all three billion of them did decide to say hi. But uh, that way they say hi is to disperse themselves, hover at 5,500 feet and hang around for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd certainly go for that. I mean, you can't rule out von Neumann probes. I mean, that, that's very uh, sophisticated, but you might say realistic uh, kind of thing to think about. And if they're self-replicating, uh, that could certainly account for why we're seeing many of them. So, um, yeah, why not? What, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about that, that of any kind of an international working group or 
uh, on an international level that would allow for people to are, you know, as opposed to this, like, you know, each country doing their own thing with national security. How, how do we get beyond that and get into the, uh, the like this international working group? Well, I certainly think that's a great idea and I would encourage it. And, uh, you know, the SCU as an organization who, in accordance with your map, has brought together at least interest from, from countries all over the globe. Uh, I mean, the SCU could be just such an organization. Uh, I know MUFON uh, tries it and, and has, has some, some uh, carry weight there. But anyway, I, I, think, I think it would be a good idea. And, and certainly, uh, specifically in the ATIP program, we went out of our way to interact with people from various South American countries and so on. So uh, getting a collective global group to address it in common and begin to share whatever particular pieces of data they have, I think that would be great. I mean, we learned a lot from the Tehran incident where the Tehran fighter pilot headed toward a UFO uh, and then had his uh, weapon system and communication system turned off, but the rest of the plane operated correctly. And that, uh, you know, these events that are happening around the globe, uh, interacting with different forms of the military and so on, uh, yeah, def definitely anything we could do to promote that, I would be all for. And Jacques Vallée, by the way, Jacques Vallée, uh, yeah. acting with the French group, JPON and so on, has been very strong on that issue. Great. Uh, did you ever get a chance to read, uh, and if so, do you have any thoughts on Ning Lee's 1993 paper on gravitic, gravo, uh, gravitoelectric electric coupling via superconductivity? Well, I certainly read all of her papers. Uh, I also participated in the MITRE conference where she made a ma major presentation. And um, <clears throat> originally I thought, you know, she may really be onto something. But the fact that it hasn't particularly gone anywhere and some of the critiques uh, that have been published from a scientific viewpoint, I found kind of compelling. So it's definitely in the gray box on the shelf. Same with the Podkletnov results from Russia. Uh, UFOs appear to be interested in our technology. Are there potential concerns for UFO encounters that should be considered during the upcoming efforts to colonize Mars? I can imagine that if UFOs are spotted on Mars by colonists, this could induce a great deal of panic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it would be nice if we're going to run into uh, uh, denizens there that we would have some kind of uh, interaction and protocols before we got to that point. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's what I would uh, hope that people would be thinking about and working on. Peer reviewed and or published papers typically require extensive corroborating data and reproducible experiments for field experts to then verify. You noted that some of the data used for the DIRD papers, uh, did you, you, you or others conduct any controlled experiments to verify any of the papers proposed hypotheses or are these uh, the results of just physics and mathematical deductive reasoning? Well, several of the papers, uh, for example, I'm thinking of uh, MHD paper out of uh, Lockheed Martin, um, <clears throat> paper on, um, capacitor, energy storage, and so on. There are several papers in that group of 38 that are actually the results of years of laboratory experimentation and data collection. And it's presented in those papers. So the papers aren't all just, uh, you know, wish list kinds of edgy uh, proposals. Several of the papers have uh, a lot of experimental data involved. So you'd have to go paper by paper, but some, some of them are really quite detailed, have uh, been published in the peer reviewed literature, have had replications in other laboratories that are referenced. So it's, uh, it depends on the paper. Uh, 
how of late it seems that there's a concentration of of cases right now that are coming forward uh, made by uh, on U U.S. military assets. Uh, do you feel that this is the case, or do you believe it's a matter of reporting or disclosure in some of those countries? I mean, what's the focus here? Why is that suddenly happening? Well, I think that for whatever reason, the UAP phenomena is highly correlated with and concentrating on, on military and um, military-like and space and nuclear uh, facilities. Why that's the case, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if anybody knows. But uh, definitely, that it's, it's not just uh, selective reporting. I mean, that does seem to be the case. And of course, that's why there's such concern behind the scenes on what the significance of this really is. In, uh, in 2021, Bulbrick and Martyr uh, published in the journal Classical, of Quantum and, uh, journal Classical and Quantum Gravity about the possibility of positive energy uh, physical warp drives as a shell uh, of regular or exotic material moving in inertially with a certain velocity, therefore requiring propulsion, requires propulsion of subliminal, subliminal spherical, spherically symmetric warp drive space times. Do you think that this approach can be valuable? Well, I think exploration of all of these approaches is valuable. And, <clears throat> and uh, from the math and the theorizing, outcome predictions, and then uh, those predictions, if we have an opportunity in the lab or an opportunity in seeing UAP uh, in the vicinity, uh, we might be able to uh, check out uh, whether those predictions are, are valid. So I think all that kind of work is, is, is certainly useful. Okay. Let's see. Uh, have, uh, have these objects convincingly demonstrated a, any kind of telepathy or psychic uh, activity? In other words, is there any connection to that? Uh, I know that you were heavily involved with uh, like you know, the remote viewing type of thing and some other kinds of studies and stuff like that. Do you see that there's any connection between uh, the objects and anything of that nature? Well, certainly there's a lot of uh, reporting of people claiming those kinds of experiences where they have interacted with some kind of being and the interaction was telepathic. So as far as I know, it's not pinned down in the scientific sense that, that all of us at SCU would, li would like to see. But nonetheless, given that there's so much of that kind of reporting going on, I and others have given thought to well, what kind of mechanisms uh, would be involved. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we've, we've done some modeling and um, I'm pursuing some communication, quantum communication technology that, you know, may, may have a, a relationship. So uh, <clears throat> I think it's a fruitful area to think about and to try to gather data on. Uh, but in terms of its relationship to UAP, phenomena, it's, uh, it's still sketchy, at least from a scientist standpoint. Um, just a question here that uh, it's been plaguing me too, is it, it seems like all the, the recent sightings and stuff like that have always been with the Navy and it seems to be that they're taking the lead right now with the DNI and everything else. The United States Air Force is responsible for control of our skies. Why is it we don't see anything from them? You know, actually, I don't, that, 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 that's a good question, and um, I actually don't know the answer. I know that the Navy has been, you might say, <clears throat> more active and uh, pro-investigation for a long time. And uh, certainly recently, it's been the Navy pilots that have had the, uh, the primary viewings, as far as we know. So I don't know whether that means the Air Force has some equivalent um, and they're just not wanting to get on the public bandwagon about it. 
or maybe for some reason uh, with a lot of the UAP coming and going from the ocean, you know, maybe it's more of a Navy thing. So uh, I don't actually know the answer to that. Okay, and we have like about one more minute and I'm just gonna ask you this last question here. Do you believe that there are any current craft that uh, have the properties of a Tic Tac objects uh, and are human groups that can take ET home? I think that's referencing, you know, the-, the Referencing Ben Rich's statements. Yeah, Ben Rich's statements. Uh, I'm skeptical. I mean, I can't absolutely write it off, but uh, with whatever access I've had, and of course, everything is still very uh, stove piped. So it could just be that I don't have the access, but I haven't seen any evidence of, of that. Sure. Well, I, th this has been quite uh, interesting and, and you've extended your stay for, uh, for a very long time and I certainly appreciate it. And there are other questions that people have there that we didn't get to, but I wanted to be able to uh, say thanks to you, Hal, for uh, all the work that you've done on this, the support you provided for the whole you know, UAP equation. I mean, getting, you've been advancing it from day one. And, uh, and I just wanna say, I'm gonna applaud you for, for doing that. And, and we, I think we should all be applauding hell. I mean, <laughs> to be honest with you, and if you're doing it at home, great, please do it loudly. <laughs> uh, but, you know, thank you for uh, all of your, your significant efforts. And we, we probably will be seeing a lot more of you uh, in the future as well. And uh, anyway, thanks for your time. We're going to be uh, moving next into a uh, kind of a panel. And, and Hal, if you'd like to be on the panel, you can just stick around. Uh, I mean, uh, we're going to, uh, it's going to be a panel. We're going to talk about some of the currently going on, uh, things that are going on uh, in, the, in the world right now. Uh, so feel free to, to hang on and be uh, one of our panelists if you're, if you're available. Okay. Well, I appreciate, first of all, I appreciate the uh, uh, the invitation that you gave me to, to, to come and speak to this issue. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying the opportunity that in fact, SCU has been set up to where we could have a forum to discuss these kinds of topics. I mean, I, I think you deserve a lot of applause also for uh, setting up this kind of a situation. I mean, it's, it's, it's really unique and uh, I, I think it's just terrific. So how do I uh, get to the panel? Well, uh, all you do is just pretty much just stick on and uh, we'll, we'll click on that going to the next session here. I'm going to stop the recording of this one and then we'll uh, begin the next session. All right. Okay. So uh, on your agenda there, you just, just pretty much hang on. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Thank you.